Take your Bible this morning, turn with me to the book of Hebrews and chapter number 2. Hebrews chapter number 2, and find with me verse number 10. Hebrews chapter number 2, and find with me verse number 10. I'm going to preach a passage of Scripture this morning that I have never in uh, my ministry, as far as I can remember, preached before. It is a fascinating piece of Scripture, and uh, I think it will help us this morning as we uh, study together from God's Word. Hebrews chapter number 2, and find verse number 10 and 11. And if I had, a, uh, I guess, a title this morning, I would title this message, My Brother, My Keeper. My Brother, My Keeper. The book of Hebrews is a fascinating book. It is one of the most difficult books, I would say, to interpret uh, in all of the Word of God. A lot of bad doctrinal concepts can come from this book when it is not rightly interpreted and rightly understood. Really, what you have to do is you have to look to the Old Testament a whole, whole bunch to understand the context of the book of Hebrews. When we talk about this book, there is really one word that comes to my mind when I study. It's the Greek word kraton, and it is a word that we would define in our language as, as simply better. Hebrews is a book about better things. Specifically, it is about the better things that we have received as believers. One of the things that we have received as believers is we have received a better family. We have received a better family. Some of you are sitting at home this morning and you're saying, Preacher, thank God, because the family I've got right now is driving me up a wall during this quarantine. Well, take heart, believer, because God has in Christ given you a better family. And in fact, in that family, we have what I would call our elder brother, and his name is Jesus Christ. The Bible gives us these pictures throughout the text to describe to us the relationship that we have with Jesus. He's the shepherd, we're the sheep. He's the bridegroom, we're the bride. I would say one of the examples that the Bible gives us in the New Testament text is that Jesus is the elder brother and that we are the younger brothers. John, in chapter 3, verse 16, did not say he was the only son, but John in chapter 3 verse 16 said he's the only begotten son. What that tells us is that Jesus is unique and set apart from all the other children of God. But he is a son of God. Jesus, according to this text in Hebrews chapter 2, is, listen to this, not ashamed to call us his brothers. But what I want to look at this morning is this. What is it that makes Jesus unashamed to call me his brother? What is it about you that makes Jesus unashamed to call you his sister? What is it that says, or what is it that makes Jesus, the elder brother, look to the Father and say, that one is worth keeping in the family. That's what I want to look at this morning from Hebrews chapter number, chapter number 2, verses 10 and 11. Let's read the text together, and let's see what God's Word has for us today. Look at verse number 10. The Bible says, for it was fitting. Everybody at home and in here say that word with me. It was fitting. That's a good, good Bible word. It was fitting for him for whom are all things, and not only for whom are all things, but also by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed. Remember I just said this? For which reason he is not ashamed 
to call them brethren. Father, this morning, help us to preach with Holy Spirit anointing. God, we come to do a task that we cannot do in our own strength, but what we can do, if you will strengthen us now and give us unction and anointing from on high. God, I pray that you would set my words on fire during this time. Speak through me now in a way that I cannot speak in my own flesh, my own strength, and my own power, but in a way that I can speak if you'll help me now today. Lord, I'm your servant, and I pray that you'd use me. Let the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart, be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, my strength and my redeemer. I ask it in Jesus' name, and everybody in agreement said, Amen. I want you to notice from this passage of Scripture, these two verses, three things that I believe describe for us why Jesus is not ashamed to call you and I his brothers and sisters. Number one, notice with me in verse number 10 that there is a plan. There is a plan that was laid out. I want to call it the plan because when it comes to all other plans, there is no plan like this plan. There are several things I want you to notice about this plan that we find from verse number 10. Number one, I want you to notice this about the plan, that the plan was in agreement with the person of God. The plan was in agreement with the person of God. It was in agreement with his person. Now you say, preacher, what in the world do you mean by that? Well, let me lay a couple of foundational facts out for you from this verse before we get into the, the deep details. Number one, when you look at verse number 10 and the Bible says it was fitting for him, we need to ask ourselves, who is the him? Well, the him here is not God the Son. The him that is being referred to in this verse, verse number 10, is God the Father. It was fitting for him. Now, what does that word fitting mean? Oh, this is a good, good Bible word. That word fitting there is the Greek word prepo. It speaks of something that is seemly, something that is suitable, or something that is right. Kenneth Wiest in his word study said that this word means that whatever is taking place is fitting with the dealings and the nature of God. When this word is used throughout the biblical text, it speaks of something being done that is in agreement with the nature of a person. So we don't want to get into any, in any controversial topics today. But for instance... Paul asks in 1 Corinthians, I believe it is 11 or 12 right in there, is it natural for a woman to pray with her head uncovered? What he's actually saying there is, is it fitting? Now some of you are like, well preacher, what in the world does that mean? I, I, I hadn't come across that verse now. Read it, it's there. Now you say, what does it mean? That's not what I'm preaching about this morning, amen? I'm preaching about Hebrews chapter 2. But I'd say to you this, it has a lot more to do with somebody's hair, than it does a bonnet. Anyway, it was fitting. It was in agreement with their nature. This word is found all throughout the New Testament. And it speaks of something that is done in agreement with a person's nature. And so the, the writer of Hebrews says here, and we don't know who he is, he says that whatever God's plan was, it was fitting with his nature according to the writer of Hebrews. Now, in order to understand this, now track with me here. I know you're watching me virtually, but you're going to have to really tune in to me here. You can't watch Andy Griffith and the preacher at the same time, or you won't ever grasp this. The writer of Hebrews is writing to Christians who come from a Jewish context. They are second-generation Christians. What that means is they're not people who were converted directly by Jesus, like the disciples, for instance. But they're people who were converted by people who were converted by Jesus. If you're sitting at home and that makes sense, just nod your head up and down. If it doesn't make sense, then call me. We'll talk about it. So they're second-generation Christians. And they have some serious issues with what the writer of Hebrews is saying here. What's he saying? The context of chapter 1 and chapter 2 is this, that Jesus Christ is better than angels. The old covenant, which was found in the Old Testament, it was given from God to men, but it was mediated primarily by angels. So for instance, 
When God wanted to give Mary a message at the beginning of the Gospels, He sent the message by angels. When God wanted to give uh, Daniel a message in the book of Daniel, He sent the message through an angel. They were primarily, according to the writer of Hebrews, the mediators of the Old Covenant. But now the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the mediator of the New Covenant. Well, these these Christians that were used to be Jews but are now Christians and they're hearing this message and they're having some real problems and they're they're getting some real confusing messages from the writer of Hebrews. And, And here's the two primary questions that they're asking. All right, so you're telling me that Jesus is better than angels. Yes. But Jesus became a man. And humans are lower than angels. Yes. And then also, this is another question I have, Hebrew writer. We don't know who you are, but whoever you are, you wrote a real deep letter. Here's another question we have. Jesus died. Angels cannot even die. How could Jesus be better than angels? If they are above humanity, and not only that, but they are unable to die. The writer of Hebrews says that God's plan was fitting, and it was fitting for Him, it was fitting for the Father, and through the Father all things exist. and by Him all things exist. Now you say, preacher, what does that mean? That means not only... You need to really grasp this. Until you grasp this in your Christian life, you'll never understand what your purpose is. Not only was everything made by God, oh, we've grasped that as Christians. God created the heavens and the earth. One of the first verses you learn in Sunday school. We learn about the seven days of creation. But I don't remember being told a lot throughout my life that not only was I created by God, but I was created totally, completely, and solely for God. No other reason was I created. And everything else is a means to this end. Why do you work, preacher, for God? Yeah, but you're a pastor. I'm a salesman. You sell for God. Why then do I go to the ball field and and participate in extracurricular activities with my kids? For God. Why am I a parent? For God. Why am I a husband? For God. Everything I do is for God. We've missed that in Christianity. We think God saved us, and we'll see Him one day. But between the here and the there, there's a whole lot of us doing a whole lot of what we want to do that has nothing to do with God's business. Now that, you say, preacher, that doesn't answer the questions that the Hebrews had. I'm going to answer them in a minute, but I want you to grasp that. It was fitting for the Father, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things means he's the source and he's the purpose. And you will never find purpose in your life until you find it in Jesus Christ. You will constantly, aimlessly wonder, looking for why you're here and why you're living and what you're even doing with all of the time that you have until you come to the realization that you were created for God. All things exist for the Father and all things exist by the Father. So... Who would better know what kind of plan it would take to make you a part of the family of God? Who would know better than the Father? Well, well, we just don't understand this plan. It was a fitting plan. Now, if you read, if you listened to my uh, Wednesday night devotional, for instance, this past Wednesday, I, I did some just some teaching on 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 25, that the cross is an offense. It's a stumbling block to the Jews, Paul said. It's a ridiculous concept to the Greeks, Paul said. But for to to us who believe it is, it's life. It's everything. See, to the whole world, it did not make any sense. but, But the writer of Hebrews says it was totally fitting. And it was in consistency with the nature of God. Let me give you some examples. In the Bible, we learn that God is wisdom. Not God has wisdom, but God is wisdom. And the cross is a picture of wisdom. That's not the word that jumps to my mind, preacher, when I think about the cross. Consider this. God paid in six hours 
for you a debt that would have taken you all of eternity to pay. You know what I call that? Call it wisdom. God knew you could not, and God knew if you had to, it would take you forever to do it. So instead, he allowed Jesus to do it on your behalf, and he did it in six hours one Friday, or Thursday, or Wednesday, or whatever day you believe he did it. All I know is he did it. Amen? And, and so, so that's wisdom. You say, preacher, I agree with that. Give me another one. Well, I would say it's consistent with his holiness. Oh, well, tell me how it's consistent with his holiness. When you look at the cross, you see this, that God must give judgment and justice for sins committed, but instead of allowing you to stand and receive the judgment for the sins that you committed, and again, it would have taken you all of eternity, God allowed his son to stand in your stead, and God did not set aside his holiness. He exercised his holiness, but in doing so, he allowed you to experience redemption and forgiveness and mercy. What's mercy? It's you not getting what you ought to have gotten. That's the holiness of God. And it's in display at the cross in God's plan. You look at the power of God, it's on display at the cross. How in one moment, just like that, did God defeat death, hell, the grave, the devil, the demons, everybody that stands against us, everybody that is our foe, in just one sweeping moment, Jesus says on the cross, it is finished, and the power of God is displayed because he defeats every enemy that you and I have in one single moment. Only our God possesses that kind of power. Only an omnipotent Father has that kind of power. Let me give you one more. Not only is it the wisdom of God, the holiness of God, the power of God, but oh, dear friend, when you look at the cross, you will never see more magnified the love of God. Paul wrote it this way when he said that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, and that God commended, he extended, he, he directed his love towards us. That while we were still sinners, alienated from the life of God, Christ died for us. And so the Hebrews said, Ryder, we, we don't understand this plan. We don't understand why God would make his son become a man and die for us. It just doesn't make any sense to us. The writer of Hebrews says, listen, it was fitting. It was appropriate. It was in agreement with his nature. But not only was it in agreement with his person, but it was in agreement with his purpose. You say, preacher, what's his purpose? Well, look at the text. For whom are all things, and by whom are all things, what's his purpose? In bringing many sons to glory. Now you say, preacher, I'm a woman, and I feel left out. When the Bible uses phrases like this, they're, 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 they're masculine in nature, and so we translate them as son, but they're actually, they could go either way. They're masculine and feminine. And so what he's saying there is sons and daughters. You're not left out, you're a part. And God's goal and God's desire was to bring many people, many sons, many daughters to glory. Speaks not only of believers. God the Father has brought many sons into glory. But you know the first one? You know the first one who was brought into glory? I'll tell you. Look at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 7. It's an Old Testament quotation. It's an Old Testament quotation. And here's what the Bible says. You have made him a little lower than the angels. What that word little there means, it speaks of time. The Old Testament writer said, for a time you have made Jesus lower than the angels, but it's a little time. Jesus is not forever lower than the angels. He's been made lower than the angels for a little time. And now we move on. You find this, by the way, in the Old Testament, Psalm chapter 8. Jesus made him lower than the angels for a little time. But now, look at what he says. You have crowned him with glory and honor. And you have set him over the works of your hands. And you have put things in subjection. You've put all things in subjection under his feet. So who's the first son? to be brought into glory. I tell you, his name's Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that because he made himself a little lower than the angels, that God has now highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. And God's crowned him in glory. He's the main attraction of heaven. 
When we come to the place where we worship Him in glory, when we leave this life and we receive the just rewards and whatever crowns we may be so blessed to receive, they'll just be used as instruments and offerings of worship to Jesus Christ who is already crowned in glory. God's desire was not just to bring His own Son into glory, His only begotten Son into glory, but God's desire is that He would bring many sons, many daughters into glory. Jesus wants a big family. Jesus wants many brothers. Jesus wants many sisters. The Bible says it is God's desire that He would bring many sons into glory. But here's what we've missed as Christians. Before Jesus received the glory, He received the sufferings. And, and I'll say something that I heard myself say in a sermon, and I don't remember where I heard this, but I, I, and, and maybe I come up with it on, off chance, but probably I heard it from somebody else. But I was listening to the Good Friday service, and I said this in the sermon, and I thought to myself, and that's pretty good. We have forgotten that the cross comes before the crown. We want the crown with no cross. We want the glory with no suffering. We want all the blessings of God without giving the obedience of God. The writer of Hebrews says this. That's not how it works. In fact, the writer of Hebrews says, you must travel the same path that Jesus traveled. Now you say, preacher, how do you know that? Well, let's, let's look ahead now. We've looked at the plan, but then second with me, look at the path. Look at the path in the first half of verse number 11. For both he, or excuse me, the last, latter half of, of verse 10. In bringing many sons to glory, that was his purpose, and also to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. The captain of their salvation was made perfect through sufferings. Let me give you two things about the path. Number one, it was pioneered by our captain. It was pioneered by our captain. Jesus Christ is described here among the many names that the Bible gives him as our captain. It's the Greek word archagon. It means he's a pioneer. He's a founder. He's a leader. The idea of the word there is that somebody starts something and then other people are allowed to come into it. For instance, in the old days, the nobility would have houses. I'm from the house of fill in the blank. And there would be a pioneer, there would be a founder of that house, and then those who would come after them would be invited into that house. And they were not the pioneers, they were not the founders, they were not the leaders, they were just people who were coming along and joining in. But there was always one pioneer, there was one founder, there was one leader, and you very accurately could have called him the captain of the house. It's used of a man who founds a family. It's used of a man who starts a city from which other people come to live in. And commonly it was used of someone who blazed a trail for which others would later come behind and travel down. We learned recently at a conference we went to that there, were two, there are two kind of peoples in the, people in the world. They're pioneers and they're settlers. Pioneers are people who want to go where nobody else has gone. They say, yeah, I know we've always done it this way, but maybe we could do it this way, and it would be better. And then there are settlers, and most people are settlers. You know what settlers say? Well, we've always done it this way. Might as well keep on doing it that way. I want to tell you something. Jesus Christ was a pioneer. You say, preacher, now where, where exactly do you glean that from this text? Let me give you some other places that this passage, that this word is used. I think it'll provide for you some context of what it means. This word is used only four times in the New Testament. Four times. And every time it's used, it's in reference to Jesus Christ. Never anybody else. Let me give you the four places. Acts chapter 3, verse 15. They're preaching. 
Peter's scolding the Pharisees. Boy, he's giving it to them. And he tells them, he says, you have killed the prince Archagon, captain of life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. You know what we celebrated last Sunday morning? We didn't just celebrate that Jesus Christ walked out of the tomb. We celebrated that Jesus trailblazed a path. He pioneered a path which nobody else had done. You say, what's the path? That Jesus Christ went into the depths of the grave and he smacked death right in the face and he walked back out with victory in his hand and he said, for all those who believe in me, you can do the exact same thing. You couldn't have blazed that path. You've got to follow somebody else and Jesus has blazed the path for you. It's used in Acts chapter 5 verse 31. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be Prince Archagon, Captain and Savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. I'd remind you that in Acts chapter 5, we've not yet experienced the Gentile Pentecost, which takes place in Acts chapter number 10. Remember that weird story where Peter has a dream and he sees all kinds of animals that God has declared unclean? And then Jesus tells Peter, he says, Peter, don't, don't call unclean what I've cleaned. There's a deeper spiritual message there that Jesus is giving to Peter. And what he's saying is, Peter, it's not just about Israel anymore. It's about Israel. It's about Ethiopia. It's about Samaria. It's about the United States of America. It's about everybody. I want everybody to be saved and become a part of the family of God. You say, preacher, what's the whole point there of Acts chapter 5? Jesus, begin, Jesus takes within himself, he pioneers a path in which he is able to do what nobody else is able to do. He's able to forgive sins. He's able to forgive sins. What path does he take to get that right? I would say he travels a path right up to the throne room of God. And he presents the finished work. He presents the nail-pierced hands and the spear-torn side, and the nail-pierced feet, and the crown of thorns that was on his head that has torn his flesh. He presents the proof of his body, the proof of the finished work, and he says, Father, because I have done the work, I now present myself as the payment for their sin, as the ability for them to forgive sins. You say, preacher, we can't forgive sins. No, you can't forgive sins, but I'll tell you one thing you can do. You can travel the same path up to the throne of God that Jesus traveled, and you can't forgive sins, but you can get forgiveness for your sins, according to 1 John chapter number 1, verse 9. God's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Then let me give you another place where it's used. I'll be done with this. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author, Archagon, captain. Not only is he the captain, but he's the finisher. He's the completer of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And then he uses it here in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11. How was Jesus Christ our captain? I'd say you can look to, to three very specific examples and find why Jesus was our captain. Number one, Jesus is our captain because of his obedience. Look at John chapter number 13, verse 15. For I have given you an example, Jesus said to his disciples as, as he was washing their feet. He said, I've given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Jesus captains our salvation by showing us that a life lived for God, a life lived in the family of God is characterized by obedience to the Father. When's the last time you prayed and you seriously sought what is God's will for my life? See, if, if we're just honest with ourselves, we live most of our lives never giving thought to what God wants. Only giving thought to that which gratifies our flesh. And we want to call ourselves followers of Jesus, but I want to tell you something, dear friend. 
we don't spend much of our days following Jesus. I've heard this a lot lately concerning the quarantine. And hear me when I say this. I'm not saying that we should be here at church this morning and we should not be quarantining. But this is what I hear a lot of people saying. A lot lot of pastors are saying this, and and it just, I don't know, kind of just sounds weird. They say, Jesus doesn't want us to live in fear, but he wants us to have common sense. 98% of the stuff you come across in this book would not be classified as common sense. would be classified and characterized as ridiculous by modern man and by most people. Moses, go up there to Pharaoh and tell him to let God's people go. (laughs) Okay. Esther, go in there to the queen of the greatest empire and tell him to let let the people go. All right, let's do it. Peter and John, y'all go up to the Sanhedrin. You tell them, you don't care what they say, you're going to preach about Jesus, and if they don't like it, they can lump it. Makes perfect sense. God never called us to live according to common sense. God called us to live according to the will of God. He called us to live in obedience to His will. And I want to tell you something. When you start living in the will of God, most people in your life will look at you and they'll say, I just don't understand what you're doing. I don't understand where you're going. I don't understand what's in your mind. And that's okay. They misunderstood him. They misunderstood his disciples. And chances are they'll misunderstand us as well if we live in obedience. Not only did Jesus captain our salvation by showing us obedience, but then also he captained our salvation by showing us that there is a way of suffering. Look at what the Bible says in 1 Peter Chapter number 2, verse 21. For to this you were called also, Peter said, because Christ also suffered for us. And in his suffering, Peter says he has left us an example. An example. When a teacher gives an example to a class, they say, this is, how you, this is how you do it. I'm showing you how to do it. Now you go do it just like this. Peter said, Jesus has given us an example of how to suffer. But then thirdly this morning, Jesus Christ has captained our salvation by showing us how to get into glory. Yes, Jesus was obedient. Yes, Jesus suffered. Jesus was the firstborn of many who was taken into glory. And all those who are obedient to the Father, all those who suffer for His will, are those who will be in glory. Now you say, preacher, it sounds to me like you're preaching a works-based salvation. No, I'm not. I believe salvation is totally of God. It's a work of God. I just believe God will so radically change you that you won't have a choice but to start working for Him. You say, preacher, I'm I'm one of Jesus' brothers. I'm one of Jesus' sisters. Let me tell you what Jesus said. You want to hear what Jesus said? Luke chapter 8, Matthew chapter 12. Jesus' mother and His brothers, His actual mother and His actual brothers came and they stood outside and they said, we'd like to talk to Him. And they came in they said, Jesus, your mama and your brothers are out here and they want to talk to you. And Jesus responded, and he said, Who's my mother? And who are my brothers? Somebody must have replied and said, Well, I guess it's Mary and them that's outside the door, Jesus. And he said, No. He said, I'll tell you who my mother is, and I'll tell you who my brothers are. My brothers are those who do the will of my father. See, this is a part of Christianity nobody wants to talk about. Because when we start talking about it, then we have to start identifying and acknowledging that a lot of what we've said just ain't flat true. 
And people that claim the name but don't live the life probably don't have possession of salvation. And that's hard to deal with. But I just want to tell you what Jesus said. And Jesus said the glory comes last after the obedience and after the sufferings. Everybody in the Bible who served Jesus lost something in this life for serving and following Him. That's the path that He walked. And if I want to be His brother, then that's the path I must walk. I'm not saying you've got to die for Him. Matter of fact, Romans 12 said Jesus really isn't interested in people dying for Him anymore. He wants some people that will live for Him. But this is the path He walked. And let me give you a third thing and I'll be done. Not only does he give us the path, but then he gives us the perfection. Look what he says in verse number 11. Why like this? Oh, I'm in 1 Peter still. Hebrews chapter number 2 is where I'm preaching from this morning. Amen? Did y'all know that? <laughs> For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one. For which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. I had several points, but here's what I want to do. I just want to describe this to you. Without any sub-points, anything, I just, I just want to describe this to you. The one who sanctifies is Jesus. The one who is being sanctified is you and I. And the Bible tells me that we are all of one. And what it speaks of there is it speaks of being the same in substance and nature. See, God the Father exercised His holiness on Jesus so that Jesus could impart His holiness into you. Did you catch that? The Father placed judgment on the back of Christ so that in turn Christ could place righteousness in the soul of the believing man. See, when Jesus walks out of the tomb and He spends 40 days on earth and then He goes to the Mount of Olives and He ascends into heaven and He sits at the right hand of God the Father, as far as salvation is concerned, His work is done. Now it's our job to respond. And when we respond, the sanctifier, who is Jesus, takes the sanctified, which is the believing believer, and he puts in that believing believer his own nature, and we become of the same substance. You say, preacher, I don't think I'm holy. Well, you better be or you ain't getting into heaven. Well, I'm not perfect. Well, thank God that's not the requirement. The requirement is not that you would live a life without sin, but the requirement is that you would place your sinful nature up on the cross with Jesus and kill it and allow His godly nature to reside and dwell inside of you. And when that happens, the sanctifier and the sanctified have something in common. If you wanted to describe it in human terms, you could say their genetic makeup is similar. And God has not taken you and improved upon you, but God has taken you and He's destroyed you and He's replaced you with Jesus. I want God to make my life better. He's not interested. I want God to improve my situation. He's not interested. What He is interested in is filling you from the top of your head to the sole of your feet with His own self. So that actually without Him, you're just an empty hollow core. But with Him, with him you are walking around with the nature of God literally in you. Both the sanctifier and the sanctified are all of one. You say, preacher, I don't know that... 
You know why I never, when I'm reading the, and I have Bibles that say this in the top, they say St. Matthew, St. Luke, St. John. I never say those because I don't want to give them any, listen, I'm a saint. Ain't nothing special about John. I'm on equal footing with John. You want to call him St. John, you ought to call me St. Blake. Because we're all the same. What makes you a saint is not how good you are. What makes you a saint is not that you pin down a Bible book. What makes you a saint is that God has gotten out of heaven and into you, and He set you aside. He's made you different. He's sanctified you, and He's put His holiness in you. And God gave us a plan. And God gave us a path. God gave us an avenue to perfection so that we might be brothers with Jesus Christ. But here's the greatest thing, and this is how I want to close it right here. Jesus condescended. It means he got out of heaven and came to this earth. He, he became lower than the angels. The writer of Hebrews describes it to them this way in the early parts of chapter number 2. He says the reason that Jesus Christ had to become lower than the angels is because he had to come down to your state. Not the state where you live, but the state that you dwell in. You're a human. And Jesus Christ had to come down to humanity and become like as we are, yet without sin. And the Bible teaches us in this passage that Jesus Christ had to do that in order to be a qualified captain. See, the Bible says here that Jesus was made perfect through sufferings. It was not His character that was made perfect. Jesus' character has always been perfect. But the Bible says that His qualifications were made perfect. You say, how do you know that? Because look at verse 18 of chapter 2, and I'll prove it to you. For in that He Himself has suffered, being tempted, He is able to aid those who are tempted. See, if Jesus Christ never came to this earth and suffered, He would not be able to aid you. But because He has suffered, because He has been tempted, because He has walked the road that He's now calling you to walk, He is able to aid you. Therefore, He's a perfect captain. And Jesus Christ got up out of heaven and He condescended down here and He came and He became a man and He took on the form of a man. And He lived His life as a man while still God. He identified with me. Why? So that in turn, He could return back to the Father. And because He had come down to this earth and identified with me, he goes back to the Father, and he tells the Father, he says, I identify with them. Blake, that's my brother. I'm the sanctifier, and he's the sanctified. We're of one nature. Augustine, the great early church father, said it this way, God makes of sons of men... Sons of God, because God hath made the Son of God, the Son of Man. What are you saying, preacher? Just wrap it up in a sentence. I'm telling you that He came down to me so that one day I could go back up to Him. He came down to my situation so that one day I could go up and enjoy His situation. Jesus Christ came down to this earth and identified Himself as a man so that one day He could in glory bring many sons to where He is. Now I want to ask you something. What kind of response does that warrant? Jesus says, you want my salvation? You've got to walk my path. You want the glory? You've got to walk in obedience. Want me to call you brother? and get in the family. Those who are my brothers, those who are my sisters, are those who do the will of the Father. Everything that Jesus did was according to the will of the Father. Everything. Every word He spoke on the cross was according to God's will. Every step He took was according to God's will. Every miracle He performed was according to the Father's will. 
That's all he cared about. He was doing the Father's will. As we bow our heads this morning and they come here in just a moment to have a time of response, I just want to invite you to do one of two things. Number one, if you're here this morning, or if you're watching this morning, and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, I want to tell you this this morning. It is His desire to bring many sons to glory, many daughters to glory, and you're one who He desires to know. You say, Preacher, how do you know that God wants me? How do you know that Jesus wants me? Because I've read in 2 Peter where he says it's his will that none should perish, but all should come to repentance. Everybody should come to know him. That's his desire. Maybe you're watching this morning you say, Preacher, I don't, I don't think I'm saved. I don't think I know Jesus Christ, but I feel him drawing me today to be saved. Maybe you would just, where you're at, pray and ask Christ to come into your heart to save you of your sins, to eradicate the old man, and to fill you with his new life. Maybe you would just say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. And I ask you to save me of my sin. I cannot save myself. But I believe in the death, the burial, and the resurrection. I believe in your finished work. And I want to give my life to you in obedience and surrender. Save me. In your name. Maybe you pray something like that. Maybe you did pray something like that. And you meant it. As I say every week, boy, if you make a decision for the Lord Jesus Christ, if you would give your life to Him, if you would be saved this morning, I would love to talk with you and tell you more about what it means to follow Jesus after salvation. Maybe you're listening this morning and you say, you know, preacher, I've just, I made a mess of this salvation thing. I know I'm saved, but I've forgotten that there's an element of obedience that follows salvation. There's an element of God doing your will and not my own. Maybe you just want to pray this morning and ask God to stir up within you that desire, again, to be obedient. You know where it starts with? Having a love for His Word. I found in my life that the deeper I fall in love with the Word of God, the deeper I fall in love with the will of God. Maybe you just want to get a hunger for His Word, for His work, and recommit your life in the area of obedience. Whatever you need to do, you're at home. Just during this time, I pray that you would respond as God leads you to. Father in heaven, we love you. We thank you for your word. Thank you for how it speaks to us and how it ministers to us in our lives. Father, we love you and we thank you for your word and your work in our hearts. Thank you for the time to worship this morning and to preach. Pray, God, that you'd be pleased with what we've done as we've just tried to do it for your name. Be with us during this time of response. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. What love could remember?